given the complexity of uh, underground infrastructure, how are you working to ensure that cities are, are properly integrating the surface and subsurface in infrastructure as well as its data? We tend to forget that there is anything underneath the ground, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Primary infrastructure obviously is roads, and then sometimes you have utilities, uh, electrical, power lines, et cetera. But there's an awful lot going on below ground. Um, it's always interesting when you have to open up a road or a street and you look at what's under there. And in the case of older cities, I mean, we're in Amsterdam, but in the case of even in New York, some of those things have been there for 250 years. So um, if anybody even kept a record of where they were when they were put in, that's long been lost. So in the case of existing, uh, you know, existing cities, you're going to have to map that stuff. Um, certainly, you could charge the departments, the utilities, and say, look, you need to map these systems. As you're doing repair work, you should be digitizing all of that and saying, we now know where all the water mains are. We now know where all the electrical conduit is. Uh, it's complex, it'll take a long time. Um, the second issue, of course, is you want to create coordination so that if you are going to cut open an intersection, for example, all the departments go in and they check so that they're not continually cutting it open, paving it over, cutting it open, paving it over. Uh, it takes a long time. In new development, I think part of it is just standards and regulations. Uh, I have a colleague who's an absolute expert in subterranean infrastructure. He's a big fan of what he calls utilidors, which are essentially underground corridors, some of them big enough you could actually stand up in, where all of the infrastructure can be allocated so that it's in the right place, it's not going to interfere with other infrastructure, it's accessible whenever you need to get to it. A lot of times it's not directly under the roadbed, it's off a little bit to the side. So that's a much more efficient and effective way to build infrastructure. It is more expensive. And so what you have to, you know, you're taking an upfront capital cost and you're balancing it against lifetime operational costs. And, you know, certainly a lot of developers, that's, that's too expensive for them. But I do think that as cities rebuild or they build new, they could begin to mandate certain standards and that will become more common practice. And how can you work with cities to help them be more proactive for future events rather than just reacting to past extreme weather? Historically, we did what worked. If something worked for 100 years, we just continued to do that. We expected conditions to stay more or less uh, static. Um, we know now that there's a lot more volatility in the system, as you mentioned. Uh, and a digital twin really becomes not just an opportunity to keep track of everything that we've built, and, but it also allows us to predict future potentials, you know, develop scenarios. If we do get a flood, what could happen? If we do get certain conditions, what could happen? Um, and then you can begin to say, hey, we've run these 100, 100 scenarios and there's three really bad risk cases that we should address and you have a chance to either, if you have to make capital investments, figure out how to do that, but you begin to proactively look at the future instead of saying, well, we just assume it'll be, it'll be the way it is. Um, it's, it's going to be increasingly an, an issue. And some of the things like, say, sea level rise or flooding, that's pretty predictable because we know, but something like a major uh, water facility breaking that's less predictable unless you say, well, wait a minute, it's 150 years old. It is ready to break. We need to get in there proactively and fix it before we have a, have a problem. Um, because you know, the reliability of infrastructure is as much a part of resilience as being elevated above sea level or you know, uh, careful in case of fires. So it's just the operation needs to continue and that's a fundamental aspect of it. And what a digital twin allows us to do is explore the permutations of what makes that actually going to happen. Finally, James, why are events like this so important for infrastructure professionals? As I said, I am not, I don't come from a digital background. I appreciate what they can do, but I am certainly not a, a power user. And for me to see sort of what the state of the art is, is very impressive. And I'm listening to the discussions this morning and I'm getting ideas and I'm making notes and I'm thinking, okay, I now know just enough to be really dangerous. But um, it's also important that you, you, what you want is these interdisciplinary groups to get together. 
so that somebody who's a digital expert is speaking to somebody who's an infrastructure expert who may be speaking to somebody who's a regulatory person. And they're all, it's like we were saying before, you want all the departments to talk to one another. You want to get people out of their silos so that even if you say, well, that's not my area of expertise, I kind of understand what they're saying. I understand what they're talking about. I understand what the important issues are. Because ultimately, I mean, cities are just incredibly, incredibly complex systems of systems. And in order for them to operate, everybody has to understand a little bit about what everybody else does. Um, there's a great quote from uh, Bruce Mao, who's a Canadian sort of polymath. And he says, when everything is connected to everything else, for better or worse, everything matters. And in cities, everything matters.